Okay, great. I'm uh, Troy Sternberg, as you mentioned, from the School of Geography at the University of Oxford. And uh, Oxford, though it's based in the UK, has a very international perspective. And I particularly like deserts. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I first traveled to uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, just as a, as a traveler in uh, 2001 and 2002. So I began to realize here's a whole big part of the world that uh, doesn't have much uh, research done, much information. And of course, from the West, for, for decades it was part of the Soviet Union and there wasn't much information or access to foreigners. So when I started doing research, it's a, it became an interesting area because it's so vast, but we, yet we have so little information about the environment, about the climate, about drought, about extreme winters. Here it's the, the mountains, the, and you have the northern Kyrgyzstan, you have southern Kyrgyzstan, different, different dynamics, and there's just so little information. Um, and and uh, because of becoming new, new democracies, new countries, the focus usually isn't on environment or, or, or water or pollution, these items. So it's a great opportunity to, to bring in outside views and then to work with uh, local comp uh, people, universities like that to, uh, to, to document some of these uh, important factors. Yeah, so we have a, a very strong partnership with the University of Central Asia uh, here in Bishkek and it has its two campuses. Uh, they're really a, a, a strong research and internationally oriented uh, university, so for us that's very good. Their academic standards, their financial standards are similar to ours, so we're, we're able to work very effectively with them. And our idea is to look at how do we make uh, development uh, more sustainable. So we're trying to develop a mediation model for sustainable infrastructure development. What that really means is how can communities, local residents, governments, companies work together uh, so that uh, development progress benefits society as a whole and communities in particular. And so the, the, the first thing is the lack of information for communities. So of course if you don't know, if you don't have facts, but you see a lot of activity, uh, communities think the worst. So the most visible or tangible way is, is water. So, uh, mining consumes great amounts of, of water. So what happens to the water after it goes through the mining process? That's very uh, unclear. Uh, Kyrgyzstan has many mountains, so some of the mount mining can't be seen. So are there what we would say uh, tailing dams or storage facilities for this uh, contaminated uh, liquid? Uh, that's, that's unclear. Communities uh, understandably think some of the uh, pollution goes into their local rivers, they drink these rivers, they use these rivers for, for their agriculture, for their animals, so they think it's uh, then in their, in their consuming this water that may damage them. So really it's about uh, more information for citizens to, do, to either confirm or dispel how money might be affecting uh, their, their health and livelihoods. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, globally, mm -hmm. there are conflicts over mining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It started in, in the USA a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. so it's no different here than other parts of the world, unfortunately. Uh, we, particularly in Africa, there's many resources. We see many of these exact same, same processes. So the, the conflict is over who benefits from the, the mining. Usually that means financial or, or jobs and who, who might feel they, uh, they are affected or suffer, which is usually the community, the local community. The, the challenge is mines and mining licenses come from the capital and deals are made between politicians and, and, and companies, but the mines are never in the capital. They're always in the rural areas in the countryside where people have less information, uh, less education, less power. So, uh, here, my experience has been the local communities are the ones that have the complaints. Perhaps local government similarly have complaints, but just different. They probably also want more information uh, from the, the mining companies. And one issue here is foreign mining companies. So these aren't Kyrgyz talking to Kyrgyz. 
They, they may be international, Chinese, Australian, Canadian. So there's lot, lots of uncertainty and it's not always clear how communities that suffer the mining uh, receive much benefit. It, that's the real challenge from many different angles. The, really, uh, the, the most advanced technique is, uh, is frameworks for sustainable mining. Mm -hmm. And the, the World Bank ha has a good work, the IFC, um, and they have the, the basic standards about community, about uh, um, environments, uh, safe drinking water, heritage, respecting cultures, things like that. So there has been work done, uh, and we should commend this, uh, however, how do we apply it here? That's the, the hard part. A government has to accept it, a company has to agree to work with the government, and part of that relates to the mining licenses and the laws. And do companies follow the law? Can Kyrgyzstan and other governments enforce their own laws? A lot of time, companies have too much power. They're very organized, they have the, the capital, uh, the machinery, the technology, and Many, many countries simply don't have the capacity to monitor or in, uh, in, impose the, the laws, affect the laws uh, and enforce them with, with the companies. To rehabilitate mm -hmm. costs money. Mm -hmm. And does the state have money? Do the companies that pollute or they, they even exist? Probably not. So if you don't have money to, to treat the soils, uh, then that's the real challenge. Think of Fukushima in Japan when the nuclear power plant burst. So Japan has the ability to remove all the topsoil and, and sequester it, you know, bury it so it's no longer around. Here that's not going to be possible or Chernobyl in Ukraine is not possible. So the first thing is, is to isolate the areas so that, that humans aren't interacting with it. As much as possible, if there's uranium or these, the, the more active material should be, should be uh, stored somewhere as safely as possible, buried, whatever, in concrete bunkers like that. But knowing the reality of it, the best thing we can hope for probably is, is to keep people out of these areas and try and keep any of this away from water supplies or uh, pastures where animals are going to be eating, then people are going to be eating. Uh, a great case is the island in the Aral Sea that where the Soviets stored nuclear waste. And it was fine as an island, no one could get there, but as the Aral Sea dried up, now people take motorbikes out there to salvage uh, metals, and that's extremely hazardous to them and to the environment. What led to it was the, the citizen action, citizen action right? Yeah. That's what you need. Yeah. And uh, I have a nice picture I sometimes show in Oxford of people protesting in Bishkek about the uranium. That's, that, that's great. And I really compliment your country and being able to do that. But that's the strength of your, your uh, budding democracy. Um, but also, don't stop now. We have to maintain it. People in Istakul told me, okay, the truck stopped for a month, but now we hear trucks. What does that mean? And today we have many ways of monitoring uh, remote sensing, for, you know, from Germany or somewhere else, Australia, they could monitor what's happening on the ground with this uranium mine, or drones or other things like that to, uh, to check, validate, and maybe demystify what's happening. Governments around the world promise many things, um, but do they always deliver? So we, we have to be vigilant and not, not just think, Okay, last summer I, I was told it stopped, but make sure it, it stopped this year, it doesn't start again next year, like that, so. But I, I would say there's a, a stage in between. Uh -huh. We want to make sure yeah, things yeah, go well. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but how much tax money does the state actually get from all this mining? Where does the money go? If you could show, if, if the government can show and the, the citizens can see the benefit of money, then, then we have an issue. But is there enough economic benefit for the environmental and economic cost? That's, that's the question. I'm not convinced that the government's making enough money from the Russian mine or the gold mines to, to justify more investment. And does more investment actually benefit 
the Kyrgyz people or does it benefit the elite? Before we encourage other minds, we should make sure we get any benefit. And my, my feeling is we probably don't get as much community uh, and national benefit as we think. So then that's the real question. And equally, with mining investment, does that take the attention of society away? Maybe there are other ways to develop. If we look at Asian countries, the most successful recent countries in development in Asia, it's Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, who have no resources. Better to invest in, in Kyrgyz, in education, uh, things like that, I would say, for a more sustainable development. So it's not just extraction. You know, can you extract, can you refine the, the metals here? Can you produce something out of the metals? Why does it have to go to China, US, Australia? I'm not an expert in all these countries, but, but uh, throughout Central Asia there's a lack of water and how do you allocate it? Uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, they've done a lot of farming. What happened to the, the rivers? Where is the Sirdaira, the Amurdaira River? That's a huge environmental issue. Errol C, the UN calls it the worst environmental disaster in the world. So those are very obvious. Um, then I, I think one of the biggest issues is not even the environment, it's the management. The Soviet management approach, like the current Chinese approach, does not care about in the environment at all. It's all about exploiting it for, for local or national benefit. So the methods they use then are, were very polluting, not just Kyrgyzstan, but all the way to Czech Republic, Poland, those areas. So that, some, of the, some of what I've seen in various parts of the world is quite appalling. So it's, it's management and leadership. And I, I personally feel uh, the bureaucrats from the Soviet era, their time has passed. It should be younger people like yourself that have a broader range of knowledge and concerns. Because if, if bureaucrats let the land be polluted or poorly treated, uh, whether it's fertilizers or, or chemical pollution, that's, that's the real problem. And because there's a lack of water, we have to worry about will we have adequate drinking water supplies? Can we grow enough food that's edible for, for our citizens? So it's really management as much as scarcity. Central Asia has always been dry and much of it a desert. That's not, not changing greatly, but how we use it, that's the issue.